this is the great tweak of sovereignty in the 21st century. Hi, Christian. This is the great tweak of sovereignty, right? This is, the, this is I think, a demonstration of the, of the flexible power of the state in being able to tap resources, taxes, revenue, value that's being created somewhere else. So, uh, I'm not going to go into this. This is just to show you that the model has been used to uh, categorize, typify, typologize different islands. Some of those islands are countries. Some of those islands are parts of other countries. Some of them are colonies. There is, of course, an overlap, as you can see. Uh, the Mirabs and the Prophets lie on different extremes. The sites occupy an intermediate space in between. But this is, uh, this is a nice diagram that, in a way, captures the... Uh, I call this. It's a kind of an ideal, ideal type uh, scenario here. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's, an, uh, it's an exploration, it's an examination of a diversified economy, first of all, that's very important. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You don't want to depend too much on one product. But the nature of that diversification, I think, is extremely interesting. First of all, there is a core. There are core functions. There's no pointer here, right? There's no uh, laser beam or anything. It won't work. OK. No worries. So if you look at the central uh, circle there, the one bang in the middle, that's supposed to represent the hard core of the economy, as I see it. The state, at whatever level, municipal, federal, provincial, right? the state's presence there, that's important. It guarantees income, usually better than average wages, usually all year round employment. If we're talking about spaces that have seasonal industries, a public sector job is going to be very important. Secondly, construction. Now, who is going to tell you that construction is a key economic activity? I am going to tell you that. Construction is very, very important. It keeps the economy going. It has enormous multiplier effects, especially if you're using local products. In your case, it would be timber. In Malta's case, it would be stone, right, depending on the environment. Uh, if you have a flourishing tourism sector, if you have a flourishing second home sector, if you have visitors, that creates incentives for construction. Right? Thirdly, informal activity, the informal economy. Again, very, very important. Remember that the nature of transactions in the world is basic, basically boils down to three different types of relationships. There's the market relationship which is governed by the private sector. There's the state and this bureaucracy, which has its own rules. But then there's reciprocity. There's something else. And many of those transactions are never recorded. Right? Don't misinterpret places that have low GDP per capita as being necessarily poor. Perhaps they want us to think that they're poor, but they may be immensely rich in what matters. See those communities when they have a crisis. See what happens. There you find out whether they're rich or not whether they're resilient or not, right? So those are the hardcore, and I say hardcore because they have to be there basically all the time, good times and bad. The segments in the outer circle are those segments that are meant to be capitalized at the right time. And notice I'm very careful in my use of words. I don't just put exports, but primary exports under preference. Primary exports means primary sector. This is stuff that's dug out of the ground or out of the sea, right? Unfortunately, many small economies, many remote economies are still stuck in the basic extraction of primary resources. By the way, it also includes oil and gas, right? The trouble with being stuck in the extraction of one lucrative resource is that it suffers what the economists call from Dutch disease. Dutch disease is what happened to the Netherlands when it found North Sea oil and gas in the 60s. What happened? Everybody, all the money wanted to go in that sector. Wages got very, very quickly, very highly inflated. All the other sectors of the economy were abandoned. And of course, there's a limit to the extent to which you can continue to extract oil and gas at super normal profits. 
once those profits started drying up, uh oh, suddenly we have a big crisis because all the other sectors have been long forgotten. So you're not necessarily better off when you strike oil and gas. You have to be extremely careful how to manage those resources, not to the exclusion of anything else. So the ideal way of exporting primary products from a peripheral region, from an island region, is actually under preference. Make sure that what you are selling is getting a better than normal price. At least, at the very least. Otherwise, what's the point? Moreover, be careful because, again, in a small community, the lobby associated with primary exports can be extremely strong politically. That lobby has an innate interest in protectionism. That lobby has an innate interest in maintaining its super normal profits when and if they exist. And of course, small jurisdictions have a very high politician to local resident ratio. It's very easy to meet your MP. It's very easy to meet your mayor. Very few people vote these people in. So each and every vote has a larger than life importance, right? And this kind of dynamic locks in a political system that's resistant to change, highly resistant to change. And this is one of the serious problems that I think many peripheral regions are facing. I'll come to that later when, I'll, when I conclude, which hopefully will be in the next five minutes. Offshoring of goods and money, tourism, remittances, geostrategic rents, which means rents that are derived from the geopolitical uh, location of a place, aid, and niche manufacturers for export. Niche manufacturers, not any manufacturers, please. Let's go for something that's well-branded, high quality, not competing with things made in China. Otherwise, there's no chance we're going to survive, right? One good way of branding these products is to brand them along with the place from which they are built or made, right? If you have uh, Rosignol wines from Prince Edward Island, Right? They're Prince Edward Island wines. There's only, well, there's actually another Prince Edward Island in the world, but it's, it's uninhabited, luckily for us. It's out in the Indian Ocean. So there's only one Prince Edward Island that can provide that kind of quality wine. And you can use the same example, of course, for other products. So these, in summary, are the winning tools, I hope, uh, of development for many of these regions. High value primary sector one that is appreciated for the place from which it is derived, for the values and characteristics associated with that place. When we talk about branding, I don't just mean product branding, but region branding, phrase branding. And of course, there has to be brand consistency. So we have to get our act together and make sure that the way in which we transfer our, the image of the place that we're from is consistent and sustainable. Bouquet manufacturing, again, high value, quality stuff, all enabled using ICT, information and communication technologies. All this somehow being driven by local specific strategic planning. The locals have to be involved. The locals cannot just be at the end of decision making. The locals are not the, ta the target and the object of development. They're the subject of development. They have to determine their own development, right? The key problem there, I'm sorry to say, is the democratic system, the political system, because even as far as the locals are concerned, they may still think that their best bet forward is to speak to their local MP. It's so easy, isn't it? How many of you don't know your local MP? Okay, you're the exception, Dieter, right? You're going to be worse off for doing that because it pays to know your local MP, it gives you power. Even though it may not be real power, but at least we think we have power, right? Because we knock on the door and we are listened to and perhaps we are served. And that is the model of development that many politicians would like us to believe is the only viable model. And we think we're lucky because we know our MPs. We don't just see them on TV, right? We know them, they know us. It's a model that's logged in a certain paradigm that prevents the empowerment of the base. Now, I'm not saying one is contrary to the other. I'm sure that some kind of compatibility can be reached because we still need the political system. We can't just bask in the glorification of locality. It wouldn't take us anywhere. 